Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. So the Houston toad used to occur from Houston to where we are now in Bastrop. In the last 50 years, we've lost almost all of that habitat. That's a pretty good bunch that you can hear. <laughs> These two biologists from Texas State are looking for a rare toad. Hey, isn't that the southern leopard frog? Yeah, it's a big male. Nice. That's Hyla versicolor, um, a gray, gray tree, tree frog. frog. Yeah. The males start out really high in the trees, and then through the night they'll move lower and lower as the females start to find them until they go down to the pond to spawn. This is where many frogs and toads meet every breeding season. Pond number two. <laughs> Dr. Michael Forstner. That is a juvenile bullfrog. Cool. Along with his students come here too. They're looking for the endangered Houston toad. One of the key aspects in Houston toad recovery is determining what's a good pond and what's not. Oh, here's some little cricket frogs. And pond two, this pond, does very well every year as compared with ponds not very far away. So our work is often here at this site. The Houston toad was one of the first amphibians ever listed as an endangered species, and it's now on the edge of extinction. So the Houston toad used to occur from Houston to where we are now in Bastrop. They're gone from Harris. Fort Bend, and Liberty. And in the last 50 years, we've lost almost all of that habitat. And as the loss of habitat continues, estimates are there's now less than 2,000 Houston toads left. Nobody. We didn't find any here, but that doesn't mean they're not. Right. Ultimately, our job is to try to make sure that we have enough pieces left that we're able to keep it through time. And that kind of planning in any urban setting or in any rural setting takes real effort. All right, I hear him, Laura, but I don't see him. Sounds like maybe he's further up. It's getting towards the end of the breeding season for the Houston toad. Here's a male right here. Nice. And there is finally some activity. And it sounds like there's a couple more down, down this way. Yeah. That's good to see. <laughs> That's good to see. Here are some gray tree frogs in the water mating. And they'll probably stay like that for a few hours. I guess it just really depends on when she's ready to lay her eggs. No female Houston toads appear interested, but the males continue to call. Look, there he is right yeah, there. I got him, I got him, I got him. And this gives the biologist. That's a recapture from last year. A chance to check on the health of the local population. And there's that speckled belly and that dark black throat. And I'll get away. We actually mark and recapture the Houston toads that we find on the property, and he's 29 grams, so that we can gauge the trend in those populations over time, 63.2. With no females to mate with, the outlook for Houston toads here at pond number two isn't good. So it's the unicorn in the woods. I mean, this is the thing that no one can find, and yet, at the same time, this is an animal that makes 3,000 eggs at a time. 3,000. To capitalize on all those eggs, 83.64. She looks good. The Houston Zoo has started a nursery of sorts. Our role in the Houston toad recovery plan is, is one of kind of last resort. Yeah, here's a female. We're starting to form a captive assurance colony, basically, and that, that is a, uh, like a fail-safe against um, the extinction of the Houston toad in the wild. The zoo took eggs from pond number two and spent over a year raising 3,000 tadpoles as they grew to toadlets and then to full adults. 
Some are kind of larger than what you'd expect because we provided them with more resources in terms of food than you would find naturally in the wild. Too quick for her. We've probably got about three or 4,000 crickets in this container right here. We go through at the moment about, about 6,000 a week. Uh, we supplement the crickets with a calcium powder and then the, the toad's able to in ingest the powder when it ingests the crickets. After a bath, amphibians tend to be sensitive to uh, the buildup of ammonia and nitrite and nitrate. The majority of these toads are bound for bass drop. Back to pond number two. There he is. This captive breeding strategy might boost the population, but with little habitat and even less public awareness, it's a desperate time indeed. I guess it serves as a educational tool. We know now how not to manage these things, how not, not to respond uh, to these situations, and I, you know, I hope we can learn from that and not make these same mistakes again. Texas Parks and Wildlife is trying to right those mistakes previously made. I'm really excited. They actually Biologist Meredith Longoria works with private landowners to help ensure that the toads of tomorrow will have a home by restoring habitat today. It looks really perfect for the toad and all kinds of other wildlife. Wonderful. Either building a new dam to create a pond or thinning out underbrush, there is money available habitat restoration. We really need to work with landowners to provide incentives and to secure funding to increase the amount of Houston toad habitat available and make improvements on what is currently left. The future of Houston toads depends on private landowners and their efforts to restore the land, to turn it back into what it once was. Well, this is really going to be great for the toads because it's going to hold water just long enough for them to be able to breed. You guys are doing a great job. I am the giantest Houston toad girl on the planet. My head is bigger than most Houston toads. 63.4. This is an investment of three years of effort, two years of planning, and a year of implementation. All right, we're ready. We're going right around the corner and up to the pond. This is the last chance to try and get Houston toads to mate this year. Is that all of them, Daniela? Yep. We just have to watch where we're walking. We'll pay attention to what they're actually doing. As far as I'm aware, no adult Houston toads have ever been released into the wild before. Babies don't do well in the wild. Adults have a better chance of survival, and there's a better chance that they could reproduce this year. Don't run from him. And soon after the toads are released, the calls commence. Paul, yo, they're starting. Call in? Yes. No way. Yes. Our guys. Yes. Holy crap. Hear it? Yes. It's at least three males. What do you hear? Our guys calling. You can hear our head started males calling, that's fantastic. And as the final group of toads are sent back to the pond. So that right here, Mike? Yep, that's perfect. Something unexpected. There's a pair of amplexus in the tub. There it is. You have that on video? <laughs> it's right there in front. Right there, see him? This is the whole point. That hold that he has on her is called amplexus and is the mating posture for the Houston toad. And that event all by itself is rare enough to have made coming out tonight worth all of the effort. This final act may be a success, but it's also a sign of how close we are to losing the Houston toad forever. Having to release Houston toads that we've head started is both good and bad in my mind. It is very good because we're actively participating in recovery. But it's bad because in some ways it means that it's gotten remarkably serious in the wild within its last holdout, within the last place that Houston toads are doing well, even here we're having to intervene.